Hello everybody. In this video we're going to look at rules for integrating linear combinations of functions. So a linear combination of the functions f and g is a new function, we'll call it l, defined as l of x equals k f of x plus l g of x where k and l are constants. So for example, here l of x equals 3 sine x minus 5x cubed this function is a linear combination of the sine function and the cubing function. 3 is playing the role of k, and negative 5 is playing the role of l. So if we know how to evaluate the definite integral of f and the definite integral of g on the same interval from a to b, then can we use this knowledge to evaluate the integral of a linear combination of f and g? And the answer is a resounding yes. And in fact, the uh, formula for this might look quite obvious to you. The integral of the linear combination is the corresponding linear combination of integrals. And so we'll think of this as the linear combination rules for integration. And you know, you may have the question, isn't this obvious? You gotta be careful because that might look quite natural, but you've seen other natural looking formulas that don't work. For example, it looks quite natural to assert that the derivative of a product is the product of the derivatives, but we know that's not how the product rule works. Looks nice, but it's false. So just because our linear combination rules for integration look nice and obvious, it doesn't mean that they are obvious. So Here's what we're going to do in this video. We're going to prove the linear combination law. It's really, if it is really obvious, then we need to see why it's obvious. And then we'll look at an application, uh, an example that uh, reveals why this is really, as a practical matter, quite convenient. So the spirit of the proof is going to be as follows. The binary operation of addition has nice properties that extend to finite sums of arbitrary length. And it follows that Riemann sums inherit these properties, which in turn implies that Riemann sums respect linear combinations. And since definite integrals are defined as limits of Riemann sums and limit laws respect linear combinations, then it turns out that definite integrals must also respect linear combinations, which is to say the integral of a linear combination will wind up being the corresponding linear combination of the integrals. So a quick review, um, it's, it's really, really good to understand where definite integrals really come from in theory. So very quickly, we have a function f, we have an interval from a to b, a partition is a way of subdividing the interval into some finite number of pieces. And if you include so-called sampling arguments, you've indicated where in each subinterval you'd like to evaluate the function. And what you'll do with those sampling arguments is you'll evaluate the function, you'll create rectangles, the values of the functions turn, turn out to be heights for boxes. If the function value is negative, then you're gonna get a negative height and a so-called, you know, a, a negative area. So this is a signed area we're calculating. And if we were very explicit about it, our Riemann sum might look something like this, using sigma notation, and then big theorem slash definition, if f is continuous on the interval from a to b and you have a sequence of partitions for which the size of the partitions go to zero, which is to say the width of the widest subinterval goes to zero as you march down through your sequence of partitions, then it turns out that if you calculate the Riemann sums using these partitions and then take the limit of that uh, as k goes to infinity here, um, this limit's independent of the particular partitions use. So it wouldn't matter which sequence we used as long as the width of the largest subinterval goes to zero. And then we define the definite integral to be that limiting value. And we interpret that number to be the signed area of the function f on the interval from a to b. So the thing to remember is at heart, definite integrals are limits of Riemann sums. And now let's go way back to the basics. Fun facts about addition. So for all real numbers a, b, and k, you have the commutative property. It doesn't matter which order you add two numbers, you're gonna get the same thing. You have the associative property, which is you can group a given ordering, a plus b plus c, 
remember, addition, this is, this is the subtle point. Addition is a binary operation. You're really only allowed to add two numbers at a time. So when you add three numbers, you have to group together a pair first to add before you add the other one. And the associative property tells you it doesn't matter which grouping you use, you're gonna come up with the same number. If associativity weren't true, addition would be a true nightmare. The distributive property tells us that when you multiply across a sum, you can also evaluate that same quantity by adding up the corresponding multiples of each term individually. So notice that all three of these properties um, refer to a, a small number of operations. So the commutative property only deals with two sum ends at a time. The associative property only deals with three sum ends at a time. And the distributive property only deals with two sum ends at a time. Now, what does this mean for general sums? Suppose you take a bunch of numbers, a, j, and you multiply them all by a common factor, k. So if you wrote that sigma notation out, you'd get something like this. Now, here's you, you, we know we can factor out the k from this sum. Now, this might seem obvious to you. But in fact, if you go back to the previous slide, and you're only allowed to use those three rules, you'll find out that proving this step requires several applications of both the distributive property and the associative property. You'll actually have to work hard to only work with two or three summons at a time to show that the top line is equal to the second line. In any case, we can take that common factor right out of the sum. And so now, what does that mean for Riemann sums? So let's remind ourselves what's going on here. This P is going to stand for all the data that's contained in a, in a decorated partition, all your sampling arguments and your subintervals. And then when you take the sum, you could write it out explicitly using sigma notation. But in the end, this is just a sum of many terms with a common factor K. And so we just discovered that we can factor that K out. And so the Riemann sum of a function that's been scaled by the factor k turns out to be equal to that scalar factor k times the Riemann sum of the unscaled function. Intuition check. So multiplication by a scalar scales or stretches functions. So if we multiply a function by some uh, constant, we will uniformly stretch all the values by that amount. And that stretch carries over to Riemann sums because remember a Riemann sum you're getting you're using those function values as heights for your boxes so that same stretch will occur for each of those boxes and therefore the areas so the sum of a scaled function is just the scalar times the sum of the original function. Now what does this mean for definite integrals? Here's the big payoff. Remember we've got a sequence of partitions whose size goes to zero then by definition, your integral of the function k f of x is going to be a limit of Riemann sums. That's our definition of the definite integral. But we know now we can factor out k from inside the Riemann sum. This is just a consequence of the scalar law for sums. And we know there's a limit law for sums, so that k can come right out of the limit. And then once again, by definition, that limit of Riemann sums is the definite integral of f on the interval from a to b. And there you have it the k pops all the way out. The integral of k times f of x is equal to k times the integral of f of x. Now let's go back to sums. Let's suppose you had a bunch of a sub j's and b sub j's, and you're adding up term by term, a1 plus b1, a2 plus b2, and so on. Now we know, it's rather obvious, that you can rearrange all of this to get the following sum. But once again, it's a good exercise to go in there and really try to prove that using only the three properties of addition that we looked at earlier. And if you only use those properties, you're gonna to have to use both of these, the commutative property and the associative property over and over again to formally show that this is true. In any case, what's happened here is we've sort of been able to split our sum. So we're able to add up the a sub j's individually and the b sub j's individually and then add those two sums together. So what does this imply for Riemann sums? Once again, we've got our partition P, which contains a lot of information in that notation there, which if we wrote it out explicitly would look like this. Now we can distribute the delta X sub J in each term, and then we can split this because of the previous slide. We've got a Riemann sum, individual terms that we can, so we can split all this sum apart, 
And that means that when we take the Riemann sum of the sum of functions f and g, it turns out that that can be written as the Riemann sum of f plus the Riemann sum of g. Intuition check, once again, graphical addition here, you, you take sort of the contributions at each argument and you add them together to find the graph of f plus g. And of course that's going to carry over to Riemann sums because you have your boxes and you're going to add those heights. And, and so the Riemann sums individually, when you add them together, should be the same as the Riemann sum of the sum function of f plus g. And now finally, back to the definite integral, as the partition size goes to zero for some sequence of partitions, then by definition, this definite integral will be a limit of Riemann sums. That's our definition of the definite integral. But now we know we can split the Riemann sums apart across f plus g. And then we have a limit law that tells us that the limit of the sum is the sum of the limits. And once again, each of these individually is giving us a definite integral by definition. And so there we have our second law, which is that the definite integral of a sum is the sum of the definite integrals. So we can see, put together, the first law tells you that you can factor multiplicative constants out of or back into, if you want, a definite integral. And the second law tells us that you can split or even combine, if you wish, integrals across sums. Now we can put these both together into one linear combination law. We can apply both at the same time. And here we've recovered the fact that the definite integral of a linear combination of functions is the corresponding linear combination of the individual definite integrals. So let's look at an example. We're going to calculate this definite integral on the interval from 0 to 3. Now, the, th the thing to notice here is that the integrand function is a linear combination. In fact, it is 5 times the function square root of 9 minus x squared plus negative 1 half times the function x squared. So we can use the linear combination rules to write this as 5 times the integral of square root of 9 minus x squared minus 1 half times the integral of x squared. This has great practical benefit because each of these integrals on the right side we can deal with in very different methods. So this integral of x squared, there's the fundamental theorem of calculus. If you haven't studied this yet, that's okay, you will, but just know that there's a really nice formula for calculating this definite integral. And it looks like this. And so we can evaluate this integral quite nicely. This integral, we can use a completely different method. We know that it's going to give a signed area under a graph, but in this case, the graph is a quarter circle. So all we need to do is calculate the area of this quarter circle to find the definite integral. And in this case, it's 1 quarter pi times the radius squared, 3 squared. And now we're going to combine all this information, and we get this expression for our original definite integral, which we can simplify. 45 pi over 4 minus 9 halves, or about 30.84 and change. And for good measure, we'll go over to Desmos and we'll calculate both the definite integral and write out the uh, exact expression we got to make sure it all matches and it looks good.